Hey everybody, I'm Zach. And I'm Jesse. And you're watching In Depth. On Now You Know. So Tesla just had their Q4 2022 earnings call. Let's jump right in. Let's look at the highlights first, because I know you guys are busy. You probably don't want to listen to a conference call. So we got all the info for you right here. Starting off with, this is, of course, a record quarter, which is, I know, so boring <laughs> since almost every quarter at Tesla is yeah. a record quarter. Highest ever quarterly revenue operating income and net income. Uh, 2022 net revenue growth of 51% year over year to $81.5 billion and a net gap income more than doubled year over year to $12.6 billion. Imagine just a few years ago, people were talking about this could be a company that might go bankrupt. Yeah, and they'll never be profitable. Now they are insanely profitable. So ASPs, or average selling price, halved from 2017 to 2022. That means that basically you take those high price Model Xs and Ss, and then you start making more Model 3s and Ys. So the average selling price of your fleet goes down. But guess what? The operating margin went up from negative 14% margin to positive 17% margin. Yeah, so your price of your cars goes down, but your margins go up. You make more per car, even though you're selling them for less money. Interesting. That's amazing. And of course, uh, more cash. Always good to have cash, right? They upped their cash on hand by $1.1 billion this quarter to the most they've ever had, $22.2 billion. And in operations, uh, more energy storage deployed, up 64% year over year, and record vehicle deliveries of $1.3 million. Automotive revenues were up 33% year over year to $21.3 billion for Q4. The automotive gross margin dropped to 25.9% from 27.9% in Q3. Oh no, that's <laughs> what everyone's talking about. Your margins went down. Yeah, margins are a little lumpy. Things go up and down as your cost of goods go up, as your prices go down and so forth. But I'd just like to point out the operating margin was 16%. It's a little lumpy, you can see there throughout the year. But bottom line, Tesla is making 16 cents per dollar versus their competitors that are lucky if they're making three or four cents per dollar. So what do we... What? I also love that they spent $1.8 billion in Q4 just on capital expenditures, um, which is actually very consistent throughout the year. Yeah. Um, they spent over $7 billion in capital expenditures, all while increasing the amount of cash that they had in the bank, which to me is very exciting because, well, the more capital expenditures you do, the more like factories and stuff. Exactly. You have, you know. So let's look at this on an annual basis, because to me, the quarterly stuff is too lumpy anyway. But year over year, annual revenue up 51 percent, 71.4 billion dollars in revenue for automotive in 2022. And they're still getting money from Tesla competitors for regulatory credits. $1.7 billion of their revenue was from regulatory credits. Yeah, this story kind of goes away because people now no longer want to talk about it. But that means that their competitors had to give Tesla that money because they can't make enough EVs. Total revenue up 51% year over year to $81.4 billion, $20.8 billion in total gross profit for 2022, and cash is up 25% year over year. If we look at some of the vehicle and solar deployment, 439,701 vehicles produced in Q4, up 44% year over year. Solar deployed 100 megawatts, up 17% year over year. Storage deployed 2.4 gigawatt hours, up 152% year over year. Store and service locations, 764, that's up 19% year over year. Yeah, they don't break that out, you know, store versus service, so we don't know which is which. That's too bad. Mobile fleet is at 1,584, which is up 24% year over year, and the number of superchargers is up 35% year over year. Now, looking at some of those numbers on an annual basis, you see that the total production for 2022, 1.3 million cars made, that's up 47% year over year. Solar deployed seems to be stalled. Yeah, just 1% year over year growth. But storage deployment is going bonkers with 6.5 gigawatt hours up 64% year over year. And I think that that makes sense because Tesla Solar hasn't really changed much from last year. They're not doing that many solar roof installations mm -hmm. and the regular solar that they do is kind of boring. No offense. <laughs> Uh, I just love this installed annual vehicle capacity chart because it shows that you got Cybertruck in tooling, which mm -hmm. is exciting. You got Tesla Semi in pilot production. You got the Roadster in development. And then you got RoboTaxi and others 
in development. So We're going to learn more, hopefully, on March 1st. Yeah, that's really exciting. And if you add those numbers up, that gives it a capacity of 1.9 million, which makes sense because Elon is predicting 1.8 million cars produced in 2023. I think he might be sandbagging. He, might... he admitted that he was sandbagging, and we'll get into that later. Yeah, so at the opening uh, remarks from the call, Elon said that 2022 is the best year ever on any level. He pointed out all of the stats that we just talked about, and he said this was even during a bad year. I mean, remember, everyone, 2022 wasn't a great year. He said the most questions asked of him is about demand. So he wanted to answer that right off the bat. He said the strongest orders year to date in our history, almost twice the rate of production. And this is why they raised the Model Y price in response a little bit. Right. So if you remember, they lowered all cars across the board, across the world, they lowered all of the prices. And just recently, Tesla raised the price of the Model Y just a little bit. Basically, Elon was saying there that that is in response to the demand that basically they have to start raising the price of the Model Y. Otherwise, it's going to push out that uh, delivery timeline too far. He did touch on the announcement he made the other day about Giga Nevada. He said that they're going to be making 100 gigawatt hours of 4680s there, which is super exciting. Their goal is to make 1,000 gigawatt hours of cells internally. So that means just Tesla making cells. They're also going to buy cells from other suppliers. Wow. So that's one terawatt hour. Yes. A year. Yes. Wow. And he did remind everyone the three pillars of sustainability is EVs, solar and wind, and stationary storage. Interesting. And so, again, he's not talking about V to G at all. No. Um, even though we just reported on a study that showed that EVs could substantially help without any stationary storage, but uh, he is not interested in that. No. All right. So now we get into the more boring part of the earnings call. Yeah, but the better of the boring the part. The better of the boring this part. This is the shareholder <laughs> questions. You can ask them on say.com and uh, then they're voted up or down. So we've got the, the top questions near the top. It's actually not say.com anymore. Oh, it's like app dot say technologies. It's a pain in the ass. <laughs> so will Tesla be able to take full advantage of advanced manufacturing production credits for battery cells and packs? You get about thirty seven hundred dollars per long range Model 3 or Y. And the answer was uh, it didn't sound like they actually even know yet for sure, because they're still trying to figure out the law. But basically, he said, we expect these credits to be very significant. It sounds like they're going to get more significant as time goes on. Zachary Kirkhorn did let on that they're going to expect about 150 million to 250 million per quarter in credits, but that number will grow over time because they are well positioned in coming years to take advantage of this. And it's not that Tesla doesn't know whether or not they're going to qualify for the law. Well, they don't, but the law doesn't know right. if Tesla qualifies. They'll, they ha they've passed a law and now they have to figure out what the law means. Right. That's how the system works, sadly. So the question was, after recent price cuts, the gross margins seem to be that Tesla will drop below 20% gross margins and have an average selling price around 47000 across all models. Where do you see the average selling price and gross margins after the price cut? So Zachary started off the answer. He said, we'll be above 20% margins and above $47,000 ASP. Operating margin is what we're most focused on and that it's the right metric to be focused on is operating margin. And then Elon pointed out something which we understand. Hopefully you understand if you watch this all the time. Um, but smart retail investors, he said, understand this. Every time we sell a car, it has the ability to have full self-driving enabled through the software upgrade, which is a tremendous upside potential. Millions of cars where FSD can be sold at 100% gross margin. How can it be 100%, you ask? Because it's just software. You've already written it. Every time you sell it, it didn't really cost you anything. So the value of FSD grows and it might be the biggest value asset increase of anything in history. And what he's alluding to is basically right now there's full self-driving beta and it's very fun and very exciting, but it is not go to sleep in the car will drive you to grandma's house. Right. When that day comes and Tesla says, hey, now releasing full self-driving no beta, <laughs> that is going to be the day where, first of all, Tesla gets to to take a bunch of money that's been held in escrow. Right. And secondly, a lot of people are going to go, oh, crap, I have to have that. Exactly. And they are going to plonk down whatever the cost is right. um, if they can afford it. And so whatever the price Tesla sets, and that's what Elon means when he says the biggest value asset increase of anything in history. That is what he is talking about. This next question was kind of about him being political. It was like, uh, since Elon started political influencing polls from these different groups like Morning Consult and YouGov show that Tesla brand favorability declining in 2022 and division along partisan lines, such brand damage can impact demand. How does Tesla track favorability and how will any brand damage be mitigated? 
So Elon started off very jokey. Um, Especially about YouGov. Yeah, he doesn't like that, apparently. He doesn't trust the, <laughs> the answers there. Look, he said, I have 127 million followers. I am probably the most active social media account in the world. And he said, it's a powerful tool for driving demand. And he basically said, if I'm so popular, then why does everyone say I'm not? Then he basically went on a little plug for Twitter, saying companies should just use Twitter like Twitter, um, as opposed to advertising. I think that this... Uh, kind of skirted the the issue that's being brought up, although it is the answer to the question, which right. is, why are you so worried? I'm very popular on social media. What well, other company? No other company has this. And it goes back to demand. There is no demand problem. If there right. was, if people were not buying the cars because of Elon, then it'd then be a problem. I think, but then I think they would start to talk to Elon and be like, hey, Elon, maybe shut the up. But they've got plenty of demand. So, so he can just keep talking. I'm interested in this one. David asks, please provide a detailed explanation of where you are on the 4680 ramp. What are the current roadblocks? When do you expect to scale to 10,000 vehicles a week? And Drew Beglino, VP of Engineering, said, we are at 1,000 per week in Q4, which is no small feat. Um, and so that's not where they are now. But he said that right now we're in Texas. We have one out of the four lines in production of the 4680. We're well ahead of the Cybertruck goal. So... Basically, they need enough 4680s to fill the Cybertruck. Right. And I think the rest of them might be going into the semi-truck. And maybe something maybe else something that Elon else. alluded to. Yeah. Next question from Adam. Elon has said previously that full self-driving hardware 4 will most likely come first in Cybertruck. Is that still the current plan? Do you expect there to be an upgrade path for hardware 3 cars to hardware 4? And so Elon said that Cybertruck will have hardware for and that basically he was putting a damper on Cybertruck deliveries in 2023. Yeah, he said we're really not going to have significant numbers until 2024. Um, they're going to start the ramp in the summer, not big numbers. And then he talked about Cybertruck for a while and then he came back to the question and he said this. I don't think that an upgrade will be needed from hardware three to hardware four. He also said it's not going to be economically feasible to do so. So it's, I don't think it's as much that it wouldn't be needed because he did say that hardware three is going to be something like 200 to 300 percent safer than a human hardware four is going to be like 500 to 600 percent safer so of course you would want the safer but he did say it's not going to be economically feasible for them to do that so it seems like you're going to be stuck with hardware three if you have hardware three it's, uh, it's kind of weird uh, that's it kind is. of a weird one because i think that a lot of people thought i thought well, a lot of people thought, we all thought, who knows what everybody <laughs> thinks, but the, the idea was supposed to be that you buy the car with full self-driving, they're going to upgrade that car until it can full self-drive. Right. So what he's saying is that hardware three will be able to do it twice as safe as a human, is what he says, two to three times, and that hardware four will be five to six times safer. I think that a lot of people kind of thought that like it would always be getting better, and it probably will, but it's going to have some like hardware limitations right. that are going to prevent it from being even safer than, say, the Cybertruck. So that's uh, pretty interesting. That's a good reason to want to buy the Cybertruck. But then the other question is, will the other models get an upgrade to, to hardware 4 too? Doesn't sound like it. I mean, at some point, they're going to have some kind of upgrade. Yeah. So when when is that? I mean, maybe you'd have to pay for it, but it didn't. he just didn't make it sound like it was going to be a free upgrade. Right. And then the other question is, what if hardware 3 never gets to full self-driving? Hmm. Tesla's probably going to have to upgrade people. So that might be why they've raised the price so much. Maybe. As a bit of a hedge in case they have to rip all the cameras out of your car and put in new ones. Right. Uh, which would be uh, pretty expensive and they would be kind of held to it. Yeah. Uh, this question from Jim. Zach, when do you think Tesla insurance will become a big enough revenue source to warrant providing more details on the financials of that business so investors can compare it to other insurance companies? And Zachary said, it'll take some time until we've made enough money that it would warrant financial you know, disclosures. He did say they have like a $300 million annual revenue rate, which is like astounding for such a, like, it's a lot of money for something that Tesla doesn't talk about much. Right. It, now, I just want to point out that it's ve that's very, 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 very small. For um, them, it is. Here's a graph of the top 10 auto insurance companies, and that those numbers are in the billions. Right. Um, so you can see that Tesla isn't even close to getting on that graph. But he did say it's growing faster than the vehicle business. So that's cool. About 17% of customers in the states that they can get Tesla insurance are using their insurance. Mm -hmm. Most of them are taking that when they take delivery of the new car. Most of them don't go home and then like change their thing later. He says they have inherent stickiness, which is kind of cool. You buy the car and you also get Tesla insurance. Kind of neat, which helps them improve the total cost of ownership of Teslas because they can offer lower premiums 
And as Elon pointed out, there's two important side benefits here. One, just by offering Tesla insurance, it makes other auto insurance companies lower their premiums, which is nice for Tesla owners. So it's a big benefit to Tesla owners in that respect. And then number two, it also gives a good feedback loop to the price of repair. And basically Tesla, I guess, didn't have good numbers on <laughs> what it costs to repair the cars. Um, but now because Tesla's doing both jobs, <laughs> Tesla's right. sending a, an invoice to itself from the repair division to the insurance division. Um, now they're able to kind of take a look at, okay, well, what's breaking on these cars? How do we And they have it? an incentive to keep it lower. And he basically said, we can do a couple things. One is we can change the software so that you get into less accidents. And when you do get into an accident, we can make it so it costs less by both changing software, which I don't know how you do that, but also changing things like the design of the bumper. And also the logistics of like having service. Well, and having things in stock. I mean, have you ever noticed you get something broken on a Tesla and it takes a month to get that part? And right. that costs them a lot of money if they have to rent you a car the whole time. So now... Insurance is going to be, you know, footing that bill. It's going to do both of the things that Elon said, which is going to lower the price of insurance for all Teslas across the board because they're fixing that problem and they're competing with other insurance companies and not have like the bumpers break when you get into load speed collisions. Damien asked, is Cybertruck production still on track for mid-year? And Elon said, we expect production to start sometime this summer, but that's just the start. It's going to be very slow. It will increase exponentially, but volume production will be next year. So... Yeah, if you're not high on the list, like we are, um, don't expect to get your truck this year. Right. He's he's just putting the damper on Cybertruck. He does not want people to be expecting the trucks this year. I think you're going to see some this year, though. You're going to see some, but you're not going to see yours. Yeah. The final question from Say was from Lynn. With a near infinite global demand for energy storage, where should Tesla build the next Megapack factories? How many are needed on each continent? And it sounds like Elon, he said, we'll provide more updates in the future. It sounds like maybe we'll hear about this on Investor Day. But it does sound like they're going to try and get to a thousand gigawatt hours of production. That's kind of their goal right now. Yeah. So Walt Research asked this question. Um, you know, you're saying that you're going to have 1.8 million deliveries this year. Is that supply constrained? And Elon actually said, we're kind of sandbagging here. It could be two million if we have a smooth year. No big like supply chain problems or COVID or something like that. But yes, it's all supply limited. It's not demand limited. And then he followed up with a good question, which is that, you know, he's been looking at how much Tesla has been investing in things. And he said, like, it's amazing how much battery capacity you're getting for how little you're investing. I've estimated to be like $30 a kilowatt hour. And Elon immediately did not want to talk about exact numbers, but he did say it is amazing how little space we're allocating at Giga Nevada for the new 100 gigawatt hours of battery. If you compare that to basically it's half the size of where they're making 35 gigawatt hours today with Panasonic. So they've been figuring out how to do it more and more efficiently. And that is definitely 4680. Yes. Again, if you go back to battery day, that explains everything. Yep. <laughs> I mean, I love this picture here of the new Giga Nevada building. It's yeah. going to be amazing. He said there's other products in development, which are very exciting. They're going to blow people's minds when we reveal them. Most exciting by a long shot. And we have more great ideas than we know what to do with. Probably going to be a difficult recession year, he thinks. But long term, he's convinced that Tesla will be the most valuable company on Earth. And this kind of explains why Tesla has stalled at Giga Nevada. They knew that there was going to be some big battery technology thing coming along that was going to be much more efficient in terms of space and cost. And so maybe this is why they haven't expanded Giga Nevada yet, because why expand it if you're going to change it? Questions from New Street, Pierre Ferragou, about COGS, cost of goods sold. Um, and basically, because of these inflation years, Tesla has been having higher COGS. And he asked, when are you going to be able to get back to your kind of glory days of $36,000? And Zachary said, well, Berlin and Texas ramping up will help us bring them down. But raw material prices have had a big effect. Lithium kind of number one. Uh, aluminum has come down 20 percent. Steel has come down 30 percent year over year. So that's good. But there's just a lot of, you know, inflation has raised costs like 10%. So he said, we probably won't get there this year, but we'll make progress. And then Drew Baglino, VP of Engineering, said an interesting thing. He said, as the fleet has been starting to mature, they've been gathering data, and they think they can bring the margins down even more because we've been offering more performance than we need. What do you think he meant by this? This is kind of like the uh, the Henry Ford thing where you would go like, go find something that doesn't break on the car and make it worse. And so what Drew was alluding to was that they designed the car for like some peak performance that most of the cars never do. And so they can make some of the parts 
a little bit worse <laughs> and cheaper, specifically cheaper without affecting anything. Right. Um, yeah. Is, no, is they're not trying said. to do what Ford did, which is make them break. But they're just saying, like, we found out that we've overbuilt the cars, I think. And now they can bring down costs while keeping the cars relatively the same. From Canaccord Research, we got this question about um, adjusted prices and the landscape changing. Five years from now, who are your competitors going to be? And Elon said, well, that's a tough one. But I was just hanging out with the autopilot AI team. And we were all saying, like, who's close to us? And he said, basically... Even with the telescope, it's hard to see the second place person to us. He said right now, there's no car company he can think of that can do it. Maybe a Chinese competitor is what Lars said. And, Ch and Elon came back and said, yeah, I mean, the Chinese work harder and smarter than anyone else. If it, My guess would be it would be a Chinese company that would be second to Tesla. Well, and I think that this is interesting, right? Like Lars was talking about just EVs, mm -hmm. um, but Elon was talking only about autopilot mm. and we're talking about five years from now. Mm. So that's really interesting because like who is Tesla's competitor when cars that don't drive themselves are kind of like horses, horses. Yeah. It's like, oh, I have a horse. It's like, that's great. Uh, <laughs> awesome. Good for you. I don't know what to do with that. And then the final question was from Adam Jonas and, um, he was basically trying to get Elon to talk about what's the upcoming $25,000 vehicle. Elon would not talk about that. He said that would be jumping the gun on future announcements. But he, Elon did go in a little diatribe about the Fed again. And he said, basically, the S&P 500 gives an average annual return of five to six percent. If the Fed goes above that or close to that, it's going to make it so that no one's going to want to invest in the stock market anymore. So he's like, that's really a big worry. But then he saved kind of the best for last. This is what most CEOs would have started the call with. That's what I would we have tw over 20 billion dollars in cash and we have almost no debt. Not almost $20 billion in cash, more than $20 billion, right. $22.2 billion of cash right. in the bank. So, right? I mean, while most of their competitors have no cash and lots of debt, Tesla's the opposite. And he didn't start with that. Right. I, I just want to separate this uh, out from everything else that you might think of when we say that. $22.2 billion of cash in the bank. That's not like total assets. That's not, oh, no, like, that's just cash that's in the bank. not like market cap. That is cash actual they could go to the bank right i don't know how the bank gives them that cash but they should be able to spend that amount of money and, and as elon said and this is the multiple he said this multiple times during the call he really does seem to be predicting a severe recession this year and he said if that happens cash is king and so they want to be careful they don't want to give out too many loans for cars or anything they want to hold on to their cash and i think that's a lot because of zachary kirkhorn their um, cfo really smart guy making sure that tesla is well positioned that they can spend billions of dollars on factories and still have billions of dollars in cash. Right, because not only could they weather a storm, they could be growing during that time. I mean, if if we see a much worse recession than what we've seen so far, Tesla can still weather it and grow. And I just want to wrap up here with something that I think it's ignored. Elon has said for many, many quarters, we are guiding for 50% year over year compounded annual growth rate. That's astounding. I mean, it's one thing to pull it off one quarter or one year, but to do it over and over again. Not and, just do it over and over again, beat it. And then say we're going to do it again. Right. So they're still guiding for 50% CAGR, which is unbelievable. I think most people don't get that at all. I am super excited about Investor Day on March 1st. I can't wait to hear about whatever these new announcements are going to be. I think the Giga Nevada announcement was awesome. So if you guys are as excited as we are about Tesla and you want to keep learning more, hit the subscribe button down below. Don't forget to tune in every Tuesday to Tesla Time News, where we talk about all this stuff and more. We'll see you next time. Now you know.